Hey everybody, welcome to day 37 of our Bible in a Year Plus podcast. I'm very glad to be with you today. Uh, we're going to be reading in Leviticus 14 through 15 today, which has a lot to do with washing. In the late 1840s, Dr. Inez Semmelweis was an assistant in the maternity wards at a prestigious hospital in Vienna. And yet he noticed that the mortality rate in the delivery room where the medical students were working was three times higher than the mortality rate of what was taking place with the midwives. As a matter of fact, most of the mothers were preferring that the midwives take care of them and not the medical students. And uh, Dr. Semmelweis wondered what was going on here. And and eventually he realized that students were coming straight from the autopsy area uh, where they were touching cadavers and going to examine the women who were expecting babies and deliver their babies. And they were um, infecting these women with germs from the cadaver lab, essentially. And so he instituted a policy where the students had to wash their hands with a chlorinated solution before examining the women or delivering the babies. And as soon as he did that, the mortality rate went down to less than 1%, uh, instant success. Uh, and so he wanted this to be a permanent thing with the medical students. But what happened was his colleagues greeted his findings with hostility and ridicule, and eventually he left that hospital. Nobody believed him. In 1879, so we're decades later, still the same problem, at a seminar of the Academy of Medicine in Paris, a noteworthy speaker stood in front of the medical doctors and said that he sincerely doubted that the spread of disease was taking place due to what they were doing with their hands. The hands were not the problem. And Louis Pasteur was there, and he stood up and he said, the thing that kills women with childbirth fever is you doctors that carry deadly microbes from sick women to healthy ones. And of course, he was right. Well, all of that's taking place in 1879 and Dr. Semmelweis' 1840s, and people still didn't know about hygiene and washing their hands. And here we are in the book of Leviticus, chapters 14 and 15, talking about washing. The term washing is going to be used uh, more than two dozen times in this short little section of Leviticus. And it's all about washing. And you see that God is way ahead of his time. And so we're going to read about washings today. It's technical. It's cerebral. It's laborious. But stay with me as always in these brown paper packages tied up with string. There is a gift. And so stay with me. And we'll start in Leviticus chapter 14, verse 1. I'll be reading from the King James Version of the Bible with updated vocabulary. Uh, you can read in another version if you prefer. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought into the priest. The priest shall go forth out of the camp, and the priest shall look and see if the plague of leprosy is healed in the leper. Then the priest shall command to take for him that is to be cleansed two birds alive and clean, and cedar wood, and scarlet, and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in a clay vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it, and the cedar wood, and the scarlet, and the hyssop, and shall dip them and the living bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times, and shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the living bird loose into the open field. And he that is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes and shave off all his hair and wash himself in water that he may be clean. And after that, he shall come into the camp and shall wait around out of his tent seven days. But it shall be on the seventh day that he shall shave all his hair off his head and his beard and his eyebrows, even all his hair he shall shave off and he shall wash his clothes. Also he shall wash his flesh in water, and he shall be clean. And on the eighth day he shall take two male lambs without blemish, and one female lamb of the first year without blemish, and three-tenth deals of fine flour for a grain offering mixed with oil, and one log of oil. And the priest who makes him clean shall present the man that is to be made clean, and those things before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation." And the priest shall take one male lamb and offer him for a trespass offering and the log of oil and wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. And he shall 
kill the lamb in the place where he shall kill the sin offering and the burnt offering in the holy place. For as the sin offering is the priest, so is the trespass offering. It is most holy. And the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering, and the priest shall put it upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot. And the priest shall take some of the log of oil, and pour it into the palm of his own left hand. And the priest shall dip his right finger in the oil that is in his left hand, and shall sprinkle of the oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. And of the rest of the oil that is in his hand shall the priest put upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot, upon the blood of the trespass offering. And the remainder of the oil that is in the priest's hand, he shall pour upon the head of him that is to be cleansed, and the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord. And the priest shall offer the sin offering and make an atonement for him that is to be cleansed from his uncleanness, and afterward he shall kill the burned offering. And the priest shall offer the burned offering and the grain offering upon the altar, and the priest shall make an atonement for him, and he shall be clean. And if he is poor and cannot get so much, then he shall take one lamb for a trespass offering to be waved to make an atonement for him, and one ephah, a fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering and a log of oil, and two doves or two young pigeons, such as he is able to get, and the one shall be a sin offering and the other a burnt offering. And he shall bring them on the eighth day for his cleansing to the priest unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And the priest shall take the lamb of the trespass offering and the log of oil, and the priest shall wave them for a wave offering before the Lord. And he shall kill the lamb of the trespass offering, and the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering and put it upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot. And the priest shall pour the oil into the palm of his own left hand, and the priest shall sprinkle with his right finger some of the oil that is in his left hand seven times before the Lord. And the priest shall put of the oil that it is in his hand upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot, upon the place of the blood of the trespass offering, and the rest of the oil that is in the priest's hand. He shall put on the head of him that is to be cleansed to make an atonement for him before the Lord. And he shall offer one dove or the young pigeon such as he can get even such as he is able to get the one for a sin offering, the other for a burnt offering, with the grain offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for him that is to be cleansed before the Lord. This is the law of him in whom is the plague of leprosy, whose hand is not able to get that which pertains to his cleansing. And the Lord spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, when you come into the land of Canaan, which I give to you for a possession, and I put the plague of leprosy in a house of the land of your possession, and he who owns the house shall come and tell the priest, saying, it seems to me there is, as it were, a plague in the house. Then the priest shall command that they empty the house before the priest goes in to see the plague, that all that is in the house is not made unclean, and afterward the priest shall go in to see the house. And he shall look on the plague and see if the plague is in the walls of the house with hollow streaks, uh, greenish or reddish, which in sight are lower than the wall. Then the priest shall go out of the house to the door of the house and shut up the house seven days. And the priest shall come again the seventh day and shall look and see if the plague be uh, spread in the walls of the house. Then the priest shall command that they take away the stones in which the plague is, and they shall cast them into an unclean place outside the city. And he shall cause the house to be scraped within round about, and they shall pour out the dust that they scrape off outside the city into an unclean place. And they shall take other stones and put them in the place of those stones. And he shall take other mortar and shall plaster the house. And if the plague comes again and breaks out in the house, after that he has taken away the stones and after he has scraped the house and after it is plastered, then the priest shall come and look and see if the plague is spread in the house. It is an active leprosy in the house. It is unclean. And he shall break down the house, the stones of it, the timber of it, and all the mortar of the house, and he shall carry them forth out of the city into an unclean place. Moreover, he who goes into the house all the while that it is shut up 
shall be unclean until the evening. And he who lies in the house shall wash his clothes, and he who eats in the house shall wash his clothes. And if the priest shall come in and look upon it and see the plague has not spread in the house after the house was plastered, then the priest shall pronounce the house clean because the plague is healed. And he shall take to cleanse the house two birds and cedar wood and scarlet and hyssop. And he shall kill the one of the birds in a clay vessel over running water. And he shall take the cedar wood and the hyssop and the scarlet and the living bird and dip them in the blood of the slain bird and in the running water and sprinkle the house seven times. And he shall cleanse the house with the blood of the bird and with the running water and with the living bird and with the cedar wood and with the hyssop and with the scarlet. But he shall let the living bird go out of the city into the open fields and make an atonement for the house and it shall be clean. This is the law for all manner of plague of leprosy and scale and for the leprosy of a garment and of a house and for a swelling and for a scab and for a bright spot to teach when it is unclean and when it is clean, this is the law of leprosy. Chapter 15. And the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any man has a discharge out of his flesh, because of his discharge he is unclean. And this shall be his uncleanness in his discharge, whether his flesh runs with his discharge or his flesh is stopped from his discharge it is his uncleanness. Every bed on which he lies that has the discharge is unclean, and everything on which he sits shall be unclean. And whoever touches his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And he who sits on anything on which he sat that has the issue shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening." And he who touches the flesh of him that has a discharge shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And if he who has the discharge spits upon him who is clean, then he shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whatever saddle he rides upon that has the discharge, he shall be unclean. And whoever touches anything that was under him shall be unclean until the evening, and he who bears any of those things shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whoever he touches that has the discharge and has not rinsed his hands in water, he shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And the vessel of clay that he touches, which has the discharge, it shall be broken, and every vessel of wood shall be rinsed in water. And when he who has a discharge is cleansed of his discharge, then he shall number to himself seven days for his cleansing, and wash his clothes, and bathe his flesh in running water, and shall be clean. And on the eighth day he shall take to himself two doves, or two young pigeons, and come before the Lord to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, and give them to the priest." And the priest shall offer them, the one for a sin offering and the other for a burned offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord for his discharge. And if any man's seed of copulation go out from him, then he shall wash all his flesh in water and be unclean until the evening. And every garment and every skin on which is the seed of copulation shall be washed with water and be unclean until the evening. The woman also with whom man shall lie with seed of copulation, they shall both bathe themselves in water and be unclean until the evening. And if a woman has a discharge, and her discharge in her flesh is blood, she shall be put apart seven days, and whoever touches her shall be unclean until the evening. And everything that she lies upon in her separation shall be unclean. Everything also that she sits upon shall be unclean. And whoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And whoever touches anything that she sat upon shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. And if it be on her bed or on anything on which she sits, when he touches it, he shall be unclean until the evening. And if any man lie with her at all, and her menstrual flow be upon him, 
He shall be unclean seven days, and uh, all the bed on which he lies shall be unclean. And if a woman have her discharge of her blood many days out of the time of her separation, or if it runs beyond the time of her separation, all the days of the discharge of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation. She shall be unclean. Every bed on which she lies all the days of her discharge shall be unto her as the bed of her separation. And whatever she sits upon shall be unclean as the uncleanness of her separation. And whoever touches those things shall be unclean and shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the evening. But if she is cleansed of her discharge, then she shall number to herself seven days. After that, she shall be clean. And on the eighth day, she shall take two doves or two young pigeons, and bring them to the priest to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for her before the Lord for the issue of her uncleanness. Thus you shall separate the children of Israel from their uncleanness so that they do not die in their uncleanness when they defile my tabernacle, which is among them. This is the law of him who has a discharge, and of him whose seed goes from him and is defiled with it, and of her that is sick of her menstrual flow, and of him who has a discharge of the man and of the woman, and of him who lies with her that is unclean. And that concludes chapter 15 of Leviticus. Well, as you can see, that's all very technical, and we mentioned that there were lots of washings, and we'll mention that again in just a moment. In chapter 14, we saw the purification for the person who had a skin disorder, and now for houses. So we've talked about the people, we've talked about the fabrics, now we've talked about the houses. What shall we do if there is an infected person, an infected garment, or an infected property? In chapter 15, 1 through 33, we've been talking about these bodily fluids and washing. And this has to do then with Jewish hygiene. Uh, where we're talking about the men, we seem to be talking about gonorrhea. Uh, for women, it tends to be along the lines of uh, menstruation, uh, some things along those lines, normal or abnormal and maybe even talking about diarrhea, but it's not crystal clear. Uh, we might be only talking about the reproductive organs. In chapter 15, verses 16 through 18, you see that the Lord forbids any uh, coming to tabernacle worship uh, within 24 hours of having a, an intimate time with a spouse. And you think, well, I wonder because, I mean, it's not wrong for us to be intimate with our spouses, right? I mean, this is perfectly good and wholesome. So what's the deal with 24 hours between intimacy and coming to the tabernacle for worship? And um, we suggest that this is the case because in the pagan religion all around them, both in Egypt and in Canaan, wherever the people go in the Middle East, the pagan religion actually is sex. It was always a fertility cult. Uh, so you're asking the gods, the pagan gods, to give you more crops and um, more in your flocks and your herds. And, and it's always more livestock, more agriculture. It's fertility. And sure as the world, it always ended up being that um, sexuality was a part of the worship. And the Lord doesn't like that. So to separate his true religion from the pagan religions, he said, we are not doing that. In our case, sex is not worship. Uh, if you're going to have intimacy, then you have to wait 24 hours before coming to the tabernacle for worship. So he is segregating his true religion from all of the pagan fertility religions around the Israelites in those days. By the way, uh, today, uh, people have this idea, you know, no, no slut shaming. And, and uh, we're just pointing out here that if you are going to be a career prostitute and you have to wait 24 hours before coming to the tabernacle after intimacy and you're a career prostitute, basically you will never come to the tabernacle and worship the Lord. So we're not trying to do slut shaming, but you can see that sex workers would never be allowed to be in a right relationship with God. In chapter 15, verses 19 through 24, uh, we're talking about the isolation that comes to women during menstruation and the separation. And once again, people say, that is just so uh, cruel, that's so harsh. Uh, why would God uh, put this 
this um, inconvenience, uh, this misery on females. Why would he do that? But again, bear in mind that this is also a rest. Uh, this is uh, almost like a Sabbath. Uh, the, the women now get to lay off their chores. They, they get to just rest for the period of time when they don't feel very good anyway. So I don't think you should think of it as cruelty. You should think of it as a rest. And maybe the girls would be glad to have time off their chores for that. Uh, in all of this, and uh, we pointed this out at the beginning, but you'll notice that the ancient Israelites were required to wash their hands or even their whole bodies after touching a carcass, after touching somebody who might be ill, uh, contact with sick people. Uh, they were taught also, and we'll read about that later, to bury their feces. You just can't have these things sitting around. Uh, these were the hygiene laws that, that God uh, sent to his chosen people. And it's really an advantage. I hope you can see that. By contrast, almost 2,000 years later in Europe, the Black Death was unleashed by flea-bitten rodents that had been feasting on human feces and rotting animal carcasses, which were uh, in every open trench sewer that graced the roadways of every major city in Europe. You see how all this filth in open trench sewers, and then the rats are eating the filth, and the fleas are biting the rats, and then the fleas bite the people, and we have black death. Unbelievable. That would never happen if the people have been following the Lord's uh, rules of hygiene from way back in 1450 BC. Why is this still happening in 1800? 80. Uh, this is ridiculous. Um, even as late as 2008, a Chinese tourist was in India and he took almost 50 photos of uh, the Ganges River in which there are floating human corpses, uh, complete with birds uh, pecking away on the cadavers. And um, right next to these floating corpses are people in the Hindu faith, who are bathing themselves to be ritually purified in the sacred waters of the Ganges. Unbelievable. This is 2008. And uh, it's still happening. The Jewish people would never, ever, ever have done that. And so sometimes we look at all of these regulations in Leviticus. And I know, you know, this is like an uphill climb. A lot of people quit reading the Bible when they get to Leviticus, but you're still with me, so God bless you. But but they look at this and say, is, is God just like OCD? What is he talking about? All these washings and do this and do this. You know, is God just overthinking the situation? Um, but what the Lord was doing here, he's rescuing his people from horrible medical conditions. And we should appreciate that, you know, in spite of all of the details, like, ah, oh, it's, it's so much information. In spite of all of that, the Lord is just taking care of his people. And years later, centuries, millennia later, people are making these terrible mistakes that the children of Israel would never have made if they just followed the Lord. So what do you think is our great life lesson in all of this? Never bat against the Bible. When God puts a fence around a swimming pool, it's not because he hates children. It's because he's trying to protect them. He's trying to keep them safe. And we have to realize that all of these rules, these fences that God was erecting around his people, he was doing out of love. And so we shouldn't resent the rules of God. We should appreciate them. So let's pray. Let's ask God to um, continue to love us enough to give us rules. And we'll express gratitude for that, even when we don't necessarily understand all the rules. So you pray in your heart as I pray out loud, okay? Father God, we want to articulate our gratitude for your rules. We realize that you're just trying to take care of us. And I pray that we would trust you and follow these rules, even if we don't really understand all the reasons that stand behind them in your mind. Please help us to be your good and obedient children. And please, Lord, protect us from all the bad things that are out there as we follow your rules. And we pray for this in Jesus' very good name. Amen. Well, God bless you. 
thank you for being with us on day 37 of our Bible in a Year Plus podcast. And I sure hope I get to see you again tomorrow. Bye-bye.